right, what's up guys? Welcome to another studio episode, yet again. <laughs> Shoulder's still messed up. Going to the VA hospital next week, hopefully for the final pre-surgery consultation. And then got my trip to Scotland coming up beginning of May. So at least there will be some good Scotland content coming up. But uh, as far as wildlife goes, I haven't been able to do much wildlife lately, but I did run out to Tucson recently with a buddy of mine and wanted to do a little bit, wanted to try a little bit of wildlife and see how my shoulder was doing. So I took the R7 and the 100 to 500, uh, just keeping it light and simple and went out for a morning and I got some really great stuff, but I haven't used the R7 in a while and it kind of brought back all of these uh, feelings or memories, <laughs> reminders of, of uh, my experiences with the R7. And in the meantime, a lot of you guys have been asking me about uh, how it's been getting on with the R7, how I've been dealing with it, and just for a more thorough video uh, about it. So that's what this is. This is gonna be a long-term review. And I'm just gonna kinda go over everything that I like and dislike. I'll be honest with you guys, I've been stressing out a little bit about, in the back of my mind, about doing this video. Um, because if you know my channel, if you follow me, then you'll know that I'm not a negative person at all. I don't typically have negative things to say, and if I do, it's not overtly negative. And I'm not prefacing this by saying that there's going to be a lot of negatives here, but I'm prefacing it by, in the context of like my review on this, it's very, very skewed, and I want to be upfront about that. And I say that because I'm coming from a perspective that can't be changed. I'm coming from a perspective of being someone who is downgrading from an R5 and an R6 Mark II and, you know, those kind of things, these higher-end cameras, and then adding a, an R7 into the mix. So bearing that in mind, a lot of the negativity that I may have towards this camera is going to be geared from that perspective. I think the first thing that I would say is if you're coming from like a DSLR or an older mirrorless, uh, like, you know, the R or the RP or something like that, or if you've just never shot with an R5, an R6 Mark II, or even an R6, then this camera, I think, will be amazing for you. I think it will be a massive upgrade, and I think it will most likely be worth it. I'm coming at this from mostly a wildlife perspective, but I have used the camera in some landscape stuff and, and other things like that, and I think this is probably the best all-around APS-C camera that Canon has ever made for sure. And it is a little bit pricier than the other ones, but it is really feature packed. And if you do more than just wildlife photography, I think you're gonna get even more out of this camera because it's fantastic for, you know, being an APS-C sensor, it's fantastic for landscape, portraits, astro. I've done a lot of astro with it and I'm totally fine with it for all of those things. That being said, I am gonna be focusing mostly on wildlife here. So let's jump right into uh, the externals and the layout. And this is <laughs> I this is where I think I probably struggle the most. Um, again, that's because I'm coming from an R5 and an R6. But let's talk about some of the things that I, I love. Um, I love the size of this thing. Overall, it's not quite as big as the R5 and the R6. But I love that, you know, I'm a normal size guy. I'm six foot one. I've got decent sized hands. And they this thing the grip is great the grip is fantastic i just i don't have a, an issue with that i don't have any hanging over bits there uh, and i'm i feel totally comfortable holding this it just it does feel like just a mini version of my r5 and r6 which i really enjoy love the flip out screen even for wildlife i use this a lot especially like with my shoulder being messed up i can't lay down or extend uh, and be in these weird positions that I would find myself in traditionally with wildlife. So having the ability to rotate this guy out and then lay it down, you know, and then maybe I could be in my blind or sitting or whatever, um, but not have to be like messing up my shoulder. Next biggest thing that I'm really happy to see in this, uh, it's a big improvement over, we still have the dial, but what we don't have on this dial is the video switch because it's now right here. And I'm very thankful for that because 
using, that was one of the things I hated most about the R6 also was having to switch from video using, or from stills to video and back, whatever, using this dial. I hate it. I hate that. Uh, so we do have the record button here and I have this set to um, record in C3. I have it set to record 4K 60 frames a second. Uh, and that's just if I need like a very fast auto, like if I'm shooting and it's like, oh, I need to grab a still, I'm in a video and then click, I'm recording. The downside to that is because it's in the, the auto click and it's in the stills mode still, you don't have control over all of the exposure settings that I would want if I versus if I switched it to the video. Uh, but for the most part, that's really great. That means I'm less likely to miss something immediate action, you know, and I'm, I'm very, very cool with that being there. And I also really appreciate that this, uh, this switch is for on off and video is on the left of the right side that I can switch to video without taking my hand off of my bigger lens and without taking this off the trigger or anything like that. I can keep it right there and just use my thumb and switch it to video. That makes me very happy. That's something even that I love my R6 Mark II, it's what I'm filming with right now. It is probably my overall favorite Canon camera. Um, I still love my R5 for other reasons, but the one thing that I really dislike about the R6 Mark II is that they they did put the switch for video, but they put it over here. And for wildlife and, and sports and action and all that stuff, it makes it really difficult because you've got to take your hand off your big lens and then move it. And then you're reduced to holding it with your right hand. And to me, that's just, I would rather the video and the on-off be over here, or at least the video, whatever. I would rather be able to do it like this with uh, how it is on the R7. So I'm very, very grateful for that as a hybrid shooter. Next thing I do, um, this is a simultaneous like and dislike. So we've got this control wheel here, which is good. It's always good to have a control wheel, but now we have in lieu of that uh, other control wheel that's on the big boys, the R5, the R6, the R3. Um, we just have this cheapo up and down arrow. And I dislike that. <laughs> that's very similar to what you find on the RP and the, I think like the R10 and all those other uh, lower tiered bodies. So I'm really bummed that we're, we lose uh, another wheel that is, you know, primarily I use for exposure purposes. And that brings me to the thing that I probably dislike the most. And that is right here. This is the new ISO button right there. That drives me nuts. So <laughs> there are a lot of different ways, luckily, um, with the lenses and stuff, you know, with the RF lenses, we have the focus ring that we can program, or not the focus ring, the RF ring, the, the multi-control ring, whatever you wanna call it. Uh, we, can, we can program that to change whatever we want. So I can set that on different lenses to control my ISO or to control my exposure compensation. Um, but then you have to do that for each lens. And if you're using different lenses and you, it's just, I hate not having the scroll wheel right here like I would on the R5 and the R6. So again, all of these negatives, like the biggest, what I'm trying to say here is that like, the biggest negatives that really I'm having is the layout issue is, it's a, it's a bit limiting coming again from a better camera. If I were to be using this camera every single day and I would have been using it every single day since I've had it, you know, for the last few months or whatever it's been, um, then I probably would have gotten used to it by now and I probably would have had some muscle memory for things. And I do to an extent, but I still find myself struggling, especially when it comes to this ISO button. I just haven't gotten over that and I'm still like psychologically wounded. <laughs> and I'm, I'm making maybe seemingly a, a bit bigger of a deal out of that. But like, my point is like, I've gotten a lot of good images with this camera. Some of my favorites even of recent 
you know, I got this um, evening grosbeak, which is pretty rare for my area, and they're just migrating north right now. And it just, luckily, a few of them showed up in my tree in, in my front yard, and I was very ecstatic. And I went and grabbed this camera first. And, you know, I got the shots, and, and then, then we went to uh, Tucson this last week, and I got some amazing shots that I'm very, very happy with. The detail's incredible, the image quality, the dynamic range, every the sharpness, you know, all of that is looking great. The extra crop factor on the 1 to 500, making that an 800, was fantastic. And the, the Phanopeplas and the, the Pyroluxias and uh, this really cool Rufus Wing Sparrow that's actually kind of, it's a lifer for me. It's pretty uncommon. Uh, just all of these great birds that I got uh, this weekend. And if you were to just go by the images alone, you'd be like, wow, this camera is amazing. It's great. And it was, but like I missed a lot of shots. And w one of the reasons we'll get to the other reasons why here in a little bit, but one of the reasons is still because of the layout and because I'm just, I haven't practiced enough. And that, again, that's something that you can fix. And if you're coming from, uh, if you're not downgrading, then you probably won't have that problem, you know, and you'll probably get used to the, the setup. Or if you're coming from like a Rebel or a DSLR or um, the RP or the R or something like that, where the controls, or maybe even an R10, where the controls are a lot more similar, you're just not gonna probably have these issues that I'm having. So I can get over that and I won't fault that. I won't fault Canon really too hard because again, it's a price bracket, it's, it's a design ergonomics decisions. Uh, there's one more thing though, that concerning the layout. So I do, I always, on all my cameras, I do dual back button focusing and I've got quite a few videos on it. You can check out my R5 or my wildlife, how to set up cameras for wildlife or all of that, where I go into detail about the hows and the whys of the dual back button focus. But basically, so we've got, so we've got this AF on button here and then we've got the star button here. So these are the two buttons that I use for my back button focusing. So I have the AF on button, this guy right here. I have that for regular spot focus, for a single spot focus. And then I have the star button set to turn AF, uh, the eye AF on and track. And that's really great for me because when the the IAF misses or drops or can't find it or whatever, I can quickly go to that spot and put the spot where I need to and then re-engage the eye. And then once it refines it, it pops right back on and holds. So, and then for all the other modes too, it works great for me because if I'm just doing landscape or whatever, then I can just use the AF on button for the single point, click it once and done, focus to where I need to on the landscape and then leave it be. And it'll act like a regular, um, single shot mode. And if I'm not holding it down, I have it always set to AI servo. That way, if I'm holding it down, then it'll be tracking even with the AF on button or the star button, whichever, as long as I'm holding one of those two down, it will track in the various methods that it's set up for. Uh, but if I just hit it once, if I just hit the AF on button once, then that's a single shot. So it's effectively having all of the, the modes in one. But what I dislike ergonomically, again, coming from the R5 and the R6, is that there is there's a lip right here where it curves around. And you can kind of see that um, by this shadow right here. And basically what that means is that when my thumb is back here on the AF on button, it has to go like up the mountain, up the hill to get to, get to this and where it's flush on the other cameras. Uh, so that's something that I have to get used to. And I have gotten used to that a little bit, but it, it is still annoying to, because it like, it throws you off when you're not, you get to do this kind of stuff with muscle memory and you don't pay attention to eventually, you don't really have to pay attention to, you, you know what buttons are which just by the feel. And that means you can keep your eye on your subject better. But with this, like when I, when I raise up a little bit, sometimes it throws me off and I'm like, am I on the right button? You know, so that that's a little bit of a challenge, but again, that's overcomable with just overcomable is that a, um, we'll make that a word <laughs>
you have the ability to overcome that with a lot of practice and with just more use because that's muscle memory. It's like anything. One thing that I do miss from the layout, and this goes, this is uh, kind of a very subjective personal preference type of thing, but on the R5 and the R6 over here, next to the menu button, uh, there is also a rate button. And personally, I use the rate button a lot because in my wildlife, I'll give you a little breakdown on my wildlife flow real quick. What I like to do is while I'm out in the field and I'm shooting after the action is done or whatever, I want to check and I'm checking to make sure things are in focus and I got the composition and the light and everything, the image looks great. Then I'll go ahead and I'll rate the images that I know that I want to take a look at first in the editing room. I'll rate those as a three, four, or five, depending on how good they are. Uh, anything less than three, I don't bother rating, but I can just quickly hit that three, you know, hit that rate button on the R5 and I really uh, miss that. So you can do that on here. You just have to hit the Q button on here and then go in and it's on the bottom and it'll show the stars and then you tap. So it's not the biggest deal in the world, but again, it's just one of those things that I kind of miss. I think for me personally, uh, this isn't like the most technical review, every single button and everything, every single feature and all of that. I think for me personally, that's pretty much all of the, the layout issues, both good and bad that I have. As someone who films also, I do appreciate the mic over here. Uh, I And as someone who films, I also passionately hate the HDMI uh, mini out. It's something that Canon just refuses to do anything about with any of their mirrorless cameras. They just, <laughs> uh, I, I know I'm not the only one that hates that, but most people don't care. And in the grand scheme of things, it is what it is. All right, I'm gonna put this down now because my arm is getting quite tired. I think the biggest type of pain for my shoulder is actually it being up like this and editing and stuff. So I've been trying to stay off the computer a little more and keep this arm from raising up. Okay, so let's talk about some of the major things that I'm sure you guys all already know about and I will reiterate them or reinforce them from any other review that you've probably seen. Uh, things that are noteworthy for the R7, things to be careful of when you're doing wildlife. The first, I would say, is probably the buffer. That is um, one of the worst things about the R7. Again, coming from a camera who doesn't really have too much of a problem with the buffer, the R5, especially when you put the R5 in C-RAW, um, but even in RAW, I very rarely hit the buffer with, with the R5. But with the R7, I hit it pretty much every time I take a consecutive shot, you know, like an action shot, because it's like literally less than two seconds. Uh, so to combat that, like everybody else, I did put it in C-RAW and that does help just a tiny bit, uh, but that buffer is still there and it's still real and it still really hurts. So you just have to train yourself to not spray and pray and not just hold down, you know, for 10 seconds straight because you're gonna hit that buffer. You gotta train yourself to feather that trigger a little bit and do, you know, three, four, five, little bursts at a time, let it clear for a second at three, you know, especially if you're doing like a long track, unless you really need, you know, 50 shots of, you know, for whatever in your action sequence that you can't miss a beat, um, then you'd probably have to put it in JPEG if you're willing to deal with that. So you just gotta keep that in mind. You really gotta pay attention to it and not forget about it and not hammer that trigger down too soon because, you know, as a bird's flying to you or if they're flying past you, you know, a lot of people tend to, when the bird, they see the bird coming and is over here and he's flapping, they start shooting when he's over here like this. But you don't want that shot. You know, you're probably gonna want this shot right here. So you gotta train yourself, start shooting from here and stop shooting right after he passes here. You don't keep shooting while the bird's way over there doing this over there. Like no matter what you're doing, right? I mean, that's just kind of, like, I just, I see that a lot. I see people shooting maybe too much. And um, if your camera has a buffer, like a bad buffer, like the R7, then that's going to hinder you because another better bird may be flying up right behind it. And you're gonna try to go to get that and your buffer's gonna be full. So you just, just be aware of that. Okay, so I'm gonna try to keep this rested a little bit. Uh, along with that, 
things to be aware of are, and I've mentioned this in a couple of my other videos. If you saw my R7 at the Bosque, uh, go check that one out if you haven't seen it. But I have a couple of other in the field wildlife videos where you can see me using it and talking about all of these things. But definitely one thing that is uh, very noticeable is the rolling shutter. So the R7 is quite notorious by now. Uh, you will have seen charts and heard people talk about how bad the rolling shutter is. It is indeed quite bad if you're using electronic shutter and fast shutter speeds and lots of panning. Um, those are all worst case scenarios for any type of camera with a rolling shutter, uh, which is most cameras. <laughs> so you will notice that and it will be worse than others. To mitigate that, normally I would say you can shoot an electronic first curtain or in uh, mechanical if you wanna avoid it altogether. And like on my R5, I have no problem shooting a mechanical because in fact, I still shoot a lot uh, in mechanical on the R5 because this brings me to the next issue with the R7 is that the, the shutter shock is very loud. It's very noticeable. And again, go check out my Bosque R7 Bosque del Apache video. You, I, I talked about it there, I used it there. You can hear it. It's very loud, it's very noticeable. And not, not only is it the loudest that I've heard, it also just has like the physically hardest uh, slap that I've heard and the shutter shock that creates a, a lot more potential for blurry images. Uh, so I dislike it using the mechanical shutter. I, I would never use the mechanical shutter personally on the R7 because of that. I would rather deal with uh, every few other images being warped or whatever than dealing with potentially most of my shots being blurry and the noise being so bad that it's scaring birds off. But if you can deal with the shutter shock and if you can get the right settings and the right light and all of that, the right motion and, and everything, then you won't have that rolling shutter issue. So all of that, I think so far, I personally would be able to deal with and I would get over and I would do the workarounds and I would put in the hours to get the layout super comfortable with my hands and then turn this into a really great wildlife camera. But there's one other problem that I really wanna talk about and this is where it's like really hard for me because it is a negative for me personally and it's what keeps me personally from using this camera. So the autofocus on the R7 is, let's talk about stills first. It's incredible and it's also the worst of the new mirrorless cameras from Canon that I've used. So let me explain. It is faster than my R5 and my R6. Um, definitely not than my R6 Mark II. Again, that camera is, if you can only get one Canon camera ever, just get, get the R6 Mark II. But it is faster in the acquisition than my R5, absolutely. And it is better with the tracking than my R5. But the downside is that it just likes to like randomly dive off the subject. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's just, you're holding it down you're locked on and it's got the eye or it's got the body or whatever, and you haven't let go, you're still holding down. You got that pressure on that back button focus. And then all of a sudden it's just, you know, it just dives right off and it jumps to a tree or it jumps to the background or, and then sometimes it'll jump back on and sometimes it just won't. And again, that's why I have the dual button focus. So when that does happen, I can switch over to spot focus. Uh, but even then, sometimes it'll just jump off, you know, and it, it'll just lose focus. And I mean, I have missed so many shots. I mean, look how many, this is a shot from Tucson. All right, so, I mean, look at these. It, it looks like it's in focus. Um, but even a lot of these are, they're minutely off and that frustrates me. So you really got to double check your focus with this thing. Um, but I mean, look at this, we got shot after shot after shot after shot and it largely looks like it's in focus. And here's the one shot that was actually in focus. But if we click on any of these, look at that not in focus. And, and that's the same story for, I mean, we can, we can click these not in focus, you know, this whole sequence, not in focus. 
again, out of all of these shots, I think this was literally the only shot that ended up being in focus. Here's the shot right next to it. Better, but maybe not perfect. Their best. So this one, absolutely in focus. But I mean, that was literally like 40 or 50 shots. But then you got this like Pyroluxia up here and it's pretty far away. You can see how small it is in the, in the frame. I mean, every one of these shots is sharp though. I already checked, like they're all sharp. It didn't miss any of these. There's the one I ended up editing, looks great. And this Faina Pepola, this super black dude out here, super goth bird, love these guys. Didn't miss a beat for any of these. Just sharp after sharp after sharp. And then there's my edited version, just absolutely beautiful image quality out of this thing. So those are just a very few examples. And I know that's not enough for a good uh, like statistical analysis, analysis or anything. Um, but I just, that's a very few recent examples of like the frustrations that I was having when it's like, when you look at those, I shot 1600 images basically, and I got 10. And yeah, there were a few more that were in focus that were redundant. I mean, obviously I got more than 10 in focus out of 1600. But really what I'm trying to say is like, compared to my R5 or my R6 Mark II, uh, or even my R6, I didn't have that great of a time in the field shooting these images. And I was very happy with the ones that, that worked and came out and I was so stoked because I love them. Um, but just the act of getting them and being out there and it's like every time I pick up the camera and I'm like, oh, here comes that bird or oh, I'm right on it or oh, this thing's happening. I'm like nervous. I'm like, am I going to run out of the buffer? Is the shutter going to be ridiculous? Is, is the image going to be too warped? Is the autofocus just going to drop off while I'm trying to, you know, shoot this guy in the face? All of these things are like on my mind while I'm trying to photograph. And that's just, it's unfortunate that I have also the AF set to like the stickiest, like you can tell it, don't leave the subject. Don't, don't jump off the subject. Don't, don't get distracted by other subjects, you know, and you can drop that sensitivity down. Uh, and that's what I've done with the R7 and it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's still just very jumpy. This is where I have the problem is that sounds really negative and it is in context of like my perspective, but I will tell you too that if you were to have given me an R7 five years ago when I had a 1DX Mark II and a 5D Mark IV and stuff like that, I would take the R7 hands down every day over both of those cameras because it's that much better, even with all of these problems. So that's what I'm saying about like, if you haven't had anything better than the R7, it's gonna blow your mind and you're gonna be very stoked. And even with the potential of missing some of these shots and all of that, overall, the tracking is so much better. The, the advantage of mirrorless over like my 5D4 and my 1DX2, I would personally, I would have taken an R7 hands down every time. It's just unfortunate that I got into an R5 and an R6 and an R6 Mark II first. <laughs> I guess the last thing that probably people were concerned with or want to know about is the ISO. So, I mean, it's a crop body. It's there. The ISO, the high ISO performance is worse than my R5. It's worse than my R6, my R6 Mark II. Obviously, they're all full frame sensors uh, and they're all incrementally better. I don't think I would really feel too comfortable shooting the R7, anything higher than 6,400, like in lower light. And so ISO is real tricky. Like you can't just say, don't ever shoot this at this ISO or, or whatever. You can't do that because it's all about ambient light. A lot of these shots were still higher ISO, even though there's a lot of daylight because I still needed that fast shutter speed and I'm shooting with a slower lens. So, you know, even though it's bright daylight, I'm still like, over a thousand, two thousand, sometimes even 3,400 ISO. And in bright daylight, high ISO is manageable. You can deal with it. It, it. it will not do the same noise patterns or they will not be as visible as when you're in darker conditions. And when you start underexposing and there's just not enough light and you're boosting the ISO to increase the brightness of the image, the exposure of the image, 
that's when you're going to start seeing the noise. And that's when I personally would rather grab one of my full frames at the loss of that extra reach because I know I'm going to get a cleaner image and it's going to be easier to deal with. We've got a lot of stuff these days with from like DxO Pure Raw and Topaz and Photoshop and Luminar. And the, I mean, there's so many denoising products out there and they all do a really great job. So that definitely mitigates for me high ISO isn't something that I would be super concerned about because the R7 does do a fairly decent job. And then when you combine that with some good post-processing uh, effort, then I think you end up really being able to increase the quality and the amount of keepers that you, you might not have done from traditional DSLRs. I didn't really talk too much about video. It doesn't seem like too much of my audience is interested in video, but I will say that I do like the video features on the R7. I love that it doesn't have a record time. I love that it does have the C-Log options. Um, I don't like that it only has IPB, but at this point, that's kind of Canon. The only Canon cameras that are gonna have the all eye compression are gonna be the R5 and the R3. Uh, and that's just, that's life, you know, that's fine. But the video autofocus seems to be actually slightly better. It seems to not jump off as much as the stills for me, at least. So I've been moderately happy about that. I've been pretty happy with the stabilization, even though you're getting a little worse stabilization because of just inherently the crop factor. Uh, it just, it's magnifying everything, you know, so that does increase the magnification of the shakes. But for the most part, you guys, uh, if you're not, if you're new to the channel, then just know that I don't ever use a tripod for wildlife photography. I just, it's my choice. I'm lazy. I don't want to carry all that gear and I'm pretty good at hand holding, you know, and, and I know how to use stabilization in, in Premiere and all that stuff. And maybe that's not your choice or whatever, but I will tell you just from hand-holding video with the R7, I've been getting video that I'm very happy with and maybe it still requires a little bit of stabilization in post, but it hasn't been too bad. So if you're a hybrid shooter like me, uh, then I think you'll definitely be able to get a lot out of that. It's got a lot of good video features there, even some that the R5 doesn't have, like the recording limits and you know the slightly better autofocusing and it has, uh, all of that stuff makes me pretty happy. All right, so I'm gonna to try to wrap it up here. Uh, who's the camera for? I think I've already pretty much laid that out. It's for anyone who is starting to get serious in wildlife, looking to upgrade into a mirrorless for the first time, coming from a DSLR, coming from a worse mirrorless. I think the question I get asked the most though, like that's a, that's a no brainer, you know, if, if you're moving up and the R7 is an upgrade from whatever you have. The, the question that I get asked a lot though really is, is this a good second camera to my R6 or to my R5? Um, to that, I would say I have a really hard time answering that because I'm still trying to decide that for myself. I keep, I really want to love it for the reach and all of that stuff. But personally, I just, I can't, if it's just me and I'm not going out for a video or on some specific assignment or something for you guys or whatever, every time I'm grabbing my R5 and that's just, that's a personal preference. There's still so many more things about the R5 that I love that just make me feel better and that I just get more out of it in the field. However, on days like my last Tucson day, when I'm out there, like that was one of the best days possible in terms of like, it was great for me. It was great psychologically, other than the frustrations, you know, that I had with the, with the camera. It was the best case scenario for the camera. The camera had every advantage and it was perfectly sunny, lots of light, beautiful birds, close birds, tame birds, you know, everything was going perfectly for that. I had a great lens, the one to 500 is incredible, you know, 800 millimeters effectively. And then coming back and, and getting the shots that I got and being so happy with them is one of those things that it just makes me really want to love the R7 and give it more chances. So I'm still on the fence about that, you know, because I have those good days, but then I have bad days and I just makes me want to just continue using my R5 and my R6 Mark II. So I'm just as stuck still after owning this camera for however many months it's been out. I'm just as stuck as you guys. I still can't even answer that for myself, let alone answer it for you as to whether or not I think it's a good backup for or second body for an R5. 
because the problem is most people will want it for the reach, you know, and I just don't know if the reach is worth it for me because of all the other downsides compared to specifically my R5. All right, so that's it. I need some tea, I need some food, <laughs> I need to edit this video. If you guys have any questions about anything that I missed uh, concerning my experiences with this so far, leave them in the comments and I will definitely answer them. Huge thanks for you if you stuck around this far. I really appreciate it. I've got some great content coming up pretty soon. Hopefully I'll be able to do some more wildlife, but I've got this trip to Scotland. I'm gonna be doing a lot of seabirds out there. I'm very excited. A lot of landscape too, but um, you know, if you're here for wildlife, I'll be getting a lot more wildlife soon. And I'm very stoked about that. We'll see if the R7 makes it to Scotland or not. <laughs> that's to be determined. But that's it. That's my long-term review. Hopefully that helped you in some way. Uh, let me know what you think. If you've had it, if you're thinking about getting it, comments down below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.